Welcome back to BOGO Biology. This video will discuss natural selection as a mechanism for evolution. We'll be discussing what natural selection is, specific examples of directional stabilizing and disruptive selection, and a few common misconceptions. Okay, here we go. You're a very lucky human. If you think about it, you're only here because every single one of your ancestors survived long enough to reproduce. We use the term fitness all the time. However, biological fitness is defined as the ability to survive and pass on one's genes in a given environment. The more offspring an organism ultimately has, the more fit it's considered to be. Since you're alive and watching this, your ancestors were all at least moderately fit. Still, when it comes to achieving biological fitness, we humans have a fair amount of help from grocery stores full of high-calorie food, modern medicine, and dating apps. Organisms in nature generally do not have these advantages. Nature is a very dangerous place. Competition for resources like food, water, and mates is fierce. Diseases and pathogens are rampant, and predators are everywhere. Certain traits can mean the difference between surviving long enough to reproduce and becoming someone's mid-afternoon snack. When creatures with certain heritable characteristics tend to reproduce more successfully, we call it natural selection. The idea of natural selection became famous when Charles Darwin published his work On the Origin of Species in 1859. In it, he proposed that each slight variation, if useful, is preserved. While some of his ideas are definitely outdated, his theory of natural selection has stood the test of time. Natural selection is one mechanism that drives a population's evolution over time. Evolution is a change in a species characteristics over several generations and is driven by natural selection. There's a few important things to keep in mind about how natural selection works. Over time, it can improve the match between an organism and its environment. The better suited an organism is to its environment, the more likely it will survive long enough to reproduce. If the environment changes, an organism may not be as fit anymore. For instance, climate change is causing temperatures to rise rapidly over much of the globe, putting tremendous stress on many species that are ill-equipped to handle hotter conditions. In many parts of the United States, we're starting to lose our oak trees because they're not as well suited to a hot environment. If a heritable variation makes an organism more competitive in its environment, that variation can become more common in a population over time. We call this accumulation of advantageous changes over the course of many generations adaptation. This brings us to misconception number one. Individuals don't evolve, populations evolve. Individual organisms retain the same genes throughout their lives, generally speaking. They can't simply swap out their genes for a more favorable set whenever they feel like it. A population, however, can change its composition over time. If a gene gives certain organisms an advantage, those organisms will eventually increase in frequency. This begs the question of how and why these variations in traits arise to begin with if they can't be swapped out at will. On the whole, random mutation is responsible for the largest share of genetic variability. There are three categories of mutation, positive, neutral, and negative. Positive mutations increase an organism's fitness. In some way, shape, or form, they make it more likely that the creature will survive long enough to reproduce. Negative mutations decrease an organism's fitness. Neutral mutations have no effect on fitness, positive or negative. Now we reach misconception number two. Variation is not goal-directed. Variation is random. Organisms can't choose which genetic variations they would like to have. Before Darwin, a scientist named Jean-Baptiste Lamarck suggested that organisms purposely acquired traits over time, which they then passed on. Following this line of thought, a giraffe would spend years and years stretching its neck to reach higher food, would somehow magically develop a longer neck, and then would have offspring with longer necks too. We now know that this is not correct. This brings us to a slightly more nuanced misconception number three. Survival of the fittest isn't quite the whole story. It's more like survival of the fit enough. These creatures who survive to pass on their genes aren't necessarily always the biggest, the strongest, or the fastest. Often, more than one variety of a trait is good enough. The runner-up giraffes can also survive to reproduce too. Now, on to the types of natural selection. There are three categories of natural selection. Directional selection, where one extreme is favored, stabilizing selection, where an intermediate is favored, and diversifying selection, where both extremes are favored simultaneously. These can be a bit difficult to envision, so we're now going to go over an example and a graph for each one. 
You might see graphs like this on various standardized tests. They're very popular on exams like the AP, the IB, the A-level, etc. They can sometimes have different colors or orientations, but the most important thing is to remember that one line usually shows what a population used to look like, and the other line shows what the population looked like later on. In this video, the black line shows the starting population, and the green line shows what it comes to look like after being put under pressure from certain conditions. In directional selection, one extreme phenotype is favored rather than an intermediate. Directional selection can be a subtle shift, or it can occur more dramatically, as in the famous case of the peppered moths. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, a population of light-colored moths inhabited the city of Manchester in the UK. These moths blended in beautifully against the neutral colored tree bark in buildings. Darker colored moths were virtually unknown, as they were so easy for predators to see. However, by the year 1848, the moth population had almost entirely changed color. Dark colored moths were now the norm, and light colored moths were more rare. Why? The city of Manchester rapidly became industrialized right around that time. The new coal-burning factories covered the city with dark, greasy soot. With the new darker habitat, predators could easily spot the light-colored moths, and any moths born with the dark color mutation were much more likely to survive long enough to reproduce. Over time, the population shifted from nearly all light-colored moths to nearly all dark moths. Other examples of directional selection include Darwin's famous population of finches, who were more likely to survive if their beaks were better suited to the food that was most readily available. In stabilizing selection, an intermediate phenotype is favored rather than one or both extremes. A great example is a peacock tail. Male peacocks are famous for their enormous colorful tails, which they use to attract female peacocks. Usually, females prefer the males with the largest and most highly colorful tails because they signal that the male is healthy and probably has good genes. Based on this, we might assume that the goal is to have as large of a tail as possible. However, in addition to attracting all the ladies, enormous tails have a couple of significant drawbacks. Males with exceptionally large tails are much more likely to be eaten before they have a chance to pass on their genes. The best of both worlds is to have a tail that is large enough to attract a mate, but not so large as to prevent you from flying. Male peacocks actually can fold up their tails and fly, but not very far. Other examples of stabilizing selection include birth weight in humans and stem height in plants. In both cases, the intermediate is favored. In diversifying selection, both extremes are selected for simultaneously, while the intermediate is selected against. Diversifying selection is much more rare relative to directional and stabilizing selection. If you think about it, it's pretty rare to have two extreme phenotypes that are equally useful at the same time, but it does happen. Rock pocket mice are an excellent example of diversifying selection. Much of the southwestern U.S. is made up of hot, dry desert climate with light-colored sand. The mice tend to have light-colored coats, and it allows them to hide from predators. However, in an area called the Valley of Fires in New Mexico, the light sand is suddenly punctuated by a large area of dark rock. This area is known as the El Malpais lava flow. Scientists believe that it is from a volcanic eruption that occurred roughly 5,000 years ago. In the area surrounding the lava flow, dark-colored rock pocket mice can also be found. Prior to the lava flow, any rock pocket mouse born in the desert with a dark coat as a result of random mutation likely would not survive long enough to reproduce. It would stand out against the light-colored sand and would be an easy target for predators. When the lava flow suddenly added areas of darker habitats, dark-colored mice suddenly were better able to survive. Today, across the Valley of the Fires region, we can now find both light and dark colored mice. But what about intermediately colored mice? A mouse with an intermediate coat would not be well suited to either the light sandy environment or the dark rocky environment. Because it would struggle to hide from predators, it would likely not survive long enough to reproduce. Because both the light and dark extremes are favored, our final population graph would look like this. As a wrap up, let's quickly explore the concept of Darwin Awards. In theory, natural selection will allow creatures with advantageous characteristics to proliferate and those with disadvantageous characteristics to be weeded out over time. Darwin Awards are not real awards for achievement. They're meant as a joke. These prizes are given out annually to honor humans who do something so incredibly stupid that they remove themselves from the gene pool and, supposedly, improve the human species in the process. These are my favorites from the last two years. Number one. After a snowstorm, a man tried to drive around barricades and warning signs onto live wires and died via electrocution. 
Number two, a person tried to take a selfie with an injured and very angry bear. And finally, number three, a man accidentally shot off his own reproductive organs while carrying an unholstered loaded gun in his underwear while shopping at Walmart. Even though he didn't die in the process and it's not a true Darwin Award, he removed his ability to reproduce, therefore he removed himself from the gene pool. If, like me, you are a terrible human being and found these funny, you can read more of them at www.darwinawards.com. That wraps up our discussion of natural selection, evolution, and adaptation, and I hope it was useful. Stay safe out there, and please remember to like, comment, and subscribe.